Welcome to the Solar Clips video series covering the basics of solar photovoltaics or solar PV. My name is Drew Chivon. I'm an extension specialist with the University of Maryland. And in previous videos, we explored how to size the wire for a solar electric system, how to rewire the junction box on the back of a solar panel, and also how to assemble PV wire and their connectors. Uh, but in today's video, we'll see how to wire a pass-through box or a combiner box, uh, which uh, both of those channel the energy coming from the solar panels into the conductors that eventually run downstream to an inverter or a charge controller. Smaller PV systems having one or two strings of solar modules often use junction boxes simply to pass through each set of conductors that are coming from the solar array. Used in this sense, a pass-through box just provides a safe location for any electrical connections to be made. This can help whenever you're transitioning from solar PV wire to a more affordable wire that could be run downstream to the inverter or a charge controller. While fuses are not required to connect two conductors inside of a uh, pass-through box, you would need some kind of connector or a wire nut or terminal block to actually make the connection. Combiner boxes, on the other hand, are often used with three or more strings and require the use of fuses or breakers since they're actually combining the current from parallel inputs or strings within the solar array. So you can use a combiner box to transition multiple conductors into a single larger cable that would be easier and less cumbersome to run downstream to the inverter or charge controller. And in this case, you'll likely have the same number of solar modules within each string since the parallel strings in the solar array would need to have the same voltage. Now with either a pass-through box or a combiner box, we can transition from the PV wire or the USE2 wire that we're, uh, that's coming from the solar array, and then we can transition that into a less expensive wire like the THWN2. So again, in this example, we have four strings in the solar array that will be connected in parallel. In this case, the combiner box serves as a junction for all of the wires coming from the solar array. Now, each string in the array has its own set of wires that enter the left side of the combiner box. The red lines represent the positive wires from each string, while the black lines are negative. The strings are connected inside the combiner box with only one positive wire in red and one negative wire in black exiting the right side of the combiner box, where it will then run downstream to an inverter or charge controller. And again, you'll need overcurrent protection whenever you combine three or more strings. Depending on the system design, the fuses or circuit breakers can be installed directly inside the combiner box itself. But it's important to verify the temperature ratings and other specifications of the overcurrent protection device since it may be subjected to high temperatures. Otherwise, the circuit may uh, experience nuisance trips or blown fuses during hot weather. This video won't explore the details of when to fuse the positive or negative lines as that becomes a bit more advanced based on the panel, inverter, and system design, uh, but you'll typically only fuse the ungrounded or hot wires when working with a standard inverter. Now, before you select any wire or other electrical components for your system, you should familiarize yourself with some of the wire tables that we've explored in previous videos as well as some of the rules that are laid out in the National Electric Code or NEC. And that will not only help to ensure a safe and operational system, uh, but an installation that doesn't meet NEC standards will not be approved by a building inspector. For starters, the NEC requires that any wire transition take place inside of an approved electrical enclosure. Splicing wires with electrical tape just will not suffice. The enclosure should be NEMA 3 or NEMA 4 rated if they're used outdoors, and they should be large enough to accommodate the necessary wire connections. Cramming wires into small junction boxes will generate too much heat, while posing a greater risk of short circuits or terminal disconnections. While you can review other videos in this training series, it's generally recommended that you consult the licensed contractor before designing and installing your own electric system. We'll start by looking at the back of one of our solar modules. As we've seen in previous videos, each solar module comes with both a positive and negative lead. An MC4 connector will typically be found on the end of each lead to make electrical connections. The leads themselves are typically PV wire or USE2 wire, which can handle exposure to moisture, high ambient temperatures, and ultraviolet light. Hence, they don't require a conduit. In any sense, these leads may run directly to a junction box, or you may use extension cables depending on what length of wire is needed. Now for this demo, we'll use some of the short extension wires that were prepared in a previous video. In this case, we're working with 10 aug PV wire, which matches the leads coming from the back of the solar panel. While this is the most common gauge that's used in residential systems, you may recall that the NEC actually dictates the minimum wire gauge and the type of wire insulation uh, based on the current and voltage that will be sent through your circuit. 
Now before we get started we need to ensure that each solar module or string has been disconnected from the system. And that'll help to ensure that it's not energized when you're working on it. The solar module should only be connected to the system after you've completed all of the necessary connections in the junction box. So with the panels disconnected, now we'll cut all of the PV extension wire to our desired length and then strip the positive and negative ends of each to expose the bare wire. Then we'll label the positive leads with red electrical tape to maintain the convention of red being the ungrounded hot conductor. Now you may opt for a maximum rating of 600 volts for the electrical enclosure that you use in your system as based on NEC regulations for residential PV systems. But the enclosure itself should also be able to accommodate all of the positive and negative conductors that you have based on the number of strings that are in the array. We would need a combiner box with four fuse holders in this example since we have four positive lines and four negative lines coming from the solar modules. In this particular box, for instance, we have four fuse holders that can each be opened individually to reveal its internal fuse. And with one of the fuse holders open, we're able to test the voltage across the fuse whenever the circuit is energized. This could be done to ensure that each string of the array is operating at the same voltage. Boxes with pre-installed terminals like this can simplify the incoming and outgoing connections, uh, but standard electrical enclosures can also be modified to serve as junction boxes. In today's video, we'll use this 6x6x4 six by six by inch steel electrical box, which is more durable than its plastic counterpart. Holes may need to be drilled for wire and conduit to pass through, but in this case we'll simply use the knockout holes that have already been stamped into the side of the box by the manufacturer. Now this box is UL rated, but as a disclaimer, it has no gasket to form a watertight seal because it's only a NEMA 1 rated for dry indoor locations. Nor is this box particularly large enough to accommodate multiple strings. It was just the only option that I had readily available at the time this video was recorded. Again, you'd actually need a NEMA 3 or NEMA 4 rated box whenever you're installing outdoors or in a wet location. But just for demonstration, we're going to put the various wires that we have today into this enclosure. And we'll need to use wire strain release in general to ensure a watertight passage for each type of wire. While something like a Romex connector um, is designed for indoor use only, we're going to use two-hold waterproof strain release in this video for all of the PV cable. So now we'll insert the strain release into their respective knockouts, then tighten the corresponding nuts, and then feed each set of PV wire through the holes. This process will be repeated for all four sets of PV wire. So now we have eight wires coming into the junction box with four positives and four negatives. Now we need to fuse each positive line. For starters, we'll strip the leads on the fuse and then connect one side of the fuse to the positive line of a PV wire using a large wire nut. You may need to use wire nuts that are water resistant and rated for high temperatures depending on the system design and application. While fuse sizing was explored in a previous video, it should be mentioned that the wire gauge will need to be rated at or above the current of the fuse. In this circuit, for instance, a 15 amp fuse is used for each panel, with the PV wire capable of handling up to 30 amps. Now we'll make the connections inside the junction box. So we'll use two terminal ground bars inside the combiner box, one on each side, but just be sure to select terminals that are rated for the wire, temperature, and current of the system. In any sense, the negative lines will run to the negative terminal and the positive line with fuses will run to the positive terminal. Tightening the screw terminals will provide secure, low resistance connections. And when we're done, the four negative lines coming from the solar panels will be connected to the negative terminal and the four positive lines will be connected to the positive terminal. Next, we'll pull the wires up from the inverter or charge controller and pass them through the other side of the enclosure. Now we've discussed wire types, sizing, and other requirements in a previous video, but many installers will switch to a THWN-2 copper wire like this one, uh, which is less expensive than the PV wire coming from the solar array. THWN-2 is a uh, thermoplastic heat and water resistant wire that's suitable for dry and wet locations with a maximum temperature of uh, 90 degrees Celsius, and that's 194 Fahrenheit. Uh, and that's an important distinction between THWN-2, like this wire, and some of the less expensive options like THHN, which is not water resistant, or perhaps the THWN, which is only rated for 75 degrees Celsius or 167 Fahrenheit. While THWN-2 wire like this can run all the way to the main service panel, uh, you may need to switch to a different gauge wire after passing through your inverter 
since the voltage and current can change whenever it's going from DC to AC. Uh, just remember proper sizing and selection of wires will ensure that your system is safe, it passes inspection, and it performs uh, as you expect it to. In any sense, we'll start by inserting this conduit adapter through the knockout on the electrical enclosure, and then we'll tighten the conduit nut on the inside. After passing the THWN2 wire through the conduit adapter on the bottom side of the enclosure, we'll now fuse the positive line as we did before. As you might recall from a previous video, this fuse will be based on the combined current coming from all four solar panels connected in parallel. Since each solar panel in this example has a short circuit current of 6.1 amps, their combined current, including the safety factors, will be 38 amps. So in this case, we'll use a 40 amp fuse on the positive line, which should work well with our 8 aug wire that's rated for 55 amps at 90 degrees Celsius. Once the positive line has been fused, we'll connect it to the positive terminal and then connect the negative THWN-2 line to the negative terminal and then tighten the screws on both. Now in outdoor settings, this THWN-2 wire should be run through conduit as it's not UV resistant. Conduit simply protects the wire from adverse weather, wildlife, or other environmental damage. Now when choosing a size and type of conduit that you'll be using with your system, it's important to consider the minimum gauge wire that can run through it. Uh, this wire size will be based on the ampacity calculations that we've discussed in a previous video, and uh, that'll help you to prevent overheating of the wire within the conduit. Inexpensive plastic conduit or PVC will work with most outdoor applications using either Schedule 40 or Schedule 80, uh, but PVC can degrade quicker than metal. With that said, EMT or electrical metallic tubing is the most common type of conduit that you'll see, while the liquid tight version LFNC and the flexible metal conduit FMC may be used when running wire through an attic, for instance. But in this case, I happen to have some flexible non-metallic liquid tight conduit that's good for outdoor and direct burial applications. And it's also sunlight resistant. Just note that the NEC does require metallic conduit uh, when it's used in a home or office. But in any sense, we have a negative line and positive line that have now been pulled through the conduit. Now the NEC also requires all physical equipment to be tied to ground. So in this case, the solar array will be grounded using a bare copper six aug wire like this uh, that's connected to the lugs of the array. For demonstration purposes, we'll simply run this equipment ground through the junction box, entering a strain relief on the top and exiting through the conduit at the bottom. While the grounding wire is simply passed through in this example, other installations may require additional connections inside the junction box depending on the system design and local building code. And as I mentioned previously, this particular enclosure is rather small for accommodating all of the strings, fuses, and terminal blocks for the system. For this reason, none of the components were permanently mounted within the enclosure. This just happened to be the only enclosure that I had readily available at the time of recording, but hopefully, in the least, it demonstrates the essential components and connections that are needed. After all the wires and connections have been completed, we'll replace the lid of the junction box and tighten the screws. Now obviously there are different types of junction boxes that can be used as either a pass-through or a combiner box, including some of the more robust residential and commercial products, but this is one relatively simple option that might work for a small application. Well, I hope this video has provided you with an understanding of how to wire a pass-through box or even a combiner box which channels the energy from the solar panels into the conductors that run downstream going to the inverter or charge controller. You can subscribe to this channel to stay connected on upcoming episodes of the Solar Clips video series, but in the meantime, please visit our website for more information on solar, photovoltaics, and other energy-related topics.